Welcome to today's webinar, which will introduce Quantum Design's MPMS-3 squid-based magnetometer. The MPMS-3 is one of the most sensitive commercial magnetometers on the market and allows the experimenter to probe the magnetic moment with squid sensitivity as a function of applied magnetic fields, up to 7 Tesla, and temperatures ranging from 1.8 to 400 Kelvin for the base system. The temperature range can be extended with additional hardware options. This particular presentation will consist of three parts. Firstly, I will describe several of the design improvements over prior MPMS generations. In particular, I will focus on sample transport, temperature control, magnetic field control, and improvements in squid sensitivity. Next, I will discuss how measurements of the DC magnetic moment are performed in the MPMS-3. In particular, I'll compare and contrast the traditional DC scan and squid VSM detection modes. Finally, the presentation will end with a discussion on how the experimenter can improve their measurement accuracy by accounting for their sample size and shape, remnant field issues inherent to superconducting magnets, and finally, background subtraction. Firstly, a little bit of history. The Magnetic Property Measurement System, or MPMS, was born in 1984, the so-called Mark I, or classic MPMS. The Mark I utilized a stepped DC extraction method to measure the magnetic moment as a function of temperature and or magnetic field. In 1995, the MPMS XL was launched and included the Reciprocating Sample Option, or RSO, which further improved measurement sensitivity. In January 2016, Quantum Design announced the obsolescence of the MPMS Classic and XL and that part availability cannot be guaranteed after 2020. Many of the OEM electronic components needed in board manufacture were obsoleted many years ago and are extremely difficult to find. Despite these challenges, we would like to continue to keep the legacy MPMS instruments operational as long as parts are available. Please contact your local sales or service representative for more information. Back to the timeline. In a parallel track of product development, the Vibrating Sample Magnetometer, or VSM, was launched for the PPMS product line. A key component for the PPMS VSM option was a new linear transport motor which enabled scanning samples over long distances and vibrating samples over a wide range of amplitudes and frequencies. I will talk more about the linear transport motor a bit later. The linear transport motor then helped to enable the largest paradigm shift in the MPMS product line with the advent of the Squid VSM in 2006. In addition to the Squid VSM detection mode, which I will talk at length about later, the Squid VSM also transitioned from the use of an RF squid to a DC squid. This change is actually apparent in the Squid VSM logo, which cleverly shows two Joseph's injunctions. Finally, in 2013, the MPMS-3 was born, which brought back the DC extraction method for measuring the magnetic moment. A significant fraction of this webinar will be spent discussing and comparing these two measurement modes. The MPMS-3 also supports many additional measurement options, such as those listed here. Many of these will become topics of future MPMS-3 webinars. The MPMS-3 can also be cryogen-free with our Evercool upgrade. A modified doer in combination with a pulse tube cryocooler eliminates the need for liquid cryogens in both liquid helium and nitrogen transfers. The system can also be cooled down with ultra-high purity helium gas. The first part of today's webinar will focus on several of the improvements to the MPMS-3 over prior MPMS generations. We'll start with the linear transport motor. Measurement precision and accuracy is directly linked to being able to accurately move and vibrate the sample. The linear transport motor utilizes an optical encoder with a 10 micron resolution to achieve the necessary precision. Squid VSM measurements can utilize a wide range of vibrational amplitudes, resulting in a dynamic range of approximately two orders of magnitude, owing to the fact that the induced measurement voltage for a Squid VSM measurement is proportional to the vibration amplitude squared. The DC scan can be performed over a 3 to 6 centimeter scan length at a variable 1 to 15 second scan speed. The sample also moves continuously through the gradiometer using a triangle wave motion. 
The triangle wave enables sample accelerations to occur outside of the data collection range and therefore a linear number of data points to be collected as a function of position. The linear transport motor utilized in the MPMS-3 allows for vastly more efficient measurements. Here I show a direct comparison of DC scans measured using an MPMS-XL, shown in blue, and an MPMS-3, shown in red. During the course of a single 32-point DC scan measured in an MPMS-XL, 10 such scans could be measured in the MPMS-3. Furthermore, due to advances in the detection electronics, the point density is also significantly larger. Note while each one of the red curves appears to be a continuous line, it is actually made up of a very dense packing of discrete data points. Moving on to magnetic field control using the MPMS-3. The MPMS-3 has a maximum field of 7 Tesla and field ramp rate of 700 Ersted per second, which is several times faster than any other measurement system, MPMS or PPMS, offered by Quantum Design. The field uniformity is specced at 0.01% across 4 centimeters. As compared to the MPMS XL, the field ramp rate is 6 times faster and achieving full field can now be accomplished in just 100 seconds. Note, while the magnetic field ramp rates are much faster in the MPMS 3, for the utmost sensitivity we do not recommend measuring while actually ramping the field. The MPMS-3 also no longer utilizes a conventional persistence switch, but instead a superconducting quick switch. Before discussing the quick switch technology, let's briefly discuss the traditional superconducting switch. The persistent switch comprises a region of the superconducting path that has been thermally sunk to a nearby resistive heater element. This small segment of the superconducting path can then be toggled between a normal state, that is the switch is open, as shown here, or a superconducting state, corresponding to a closed switch, as shown here. Opening and closing the switch is achieved by simply sourcing current to the heater. When the persistent switch is open, the magnet power supply can apply a potential difference across the open superconducting circuit, thus charging the magnet. After the desired current and field is achieved, the persistent switch is allowed to cool and therefore close, thus short-circuiting the magnet. Interestingly, at this point, the current supplied by the magnet power supply can be ramped to zero. As long as the magnet windings remain superconducting, the electric current, and therefore the magnetic field will, from a practical standpoint, persist indefinitely. In addition to completely eliminating any noise issues from the power supply, being able to reduce the current from the power supply to zero has the added benefit of significantly reducing liquid helium boil-off in the case of non-superconducting magnet leads. As the wire that constitutes the persistent switch must also be able to carry the same current as the superconducting magnet, it has to be thick enough to support several tens of amps worth of electric current. It can therefore take a significant amount of time, typically tens of seconds, to heat and cool this segment of wire to flip the persistent switch. Furthermore, before opening the switch to charge the magnet, the voltage of the magnet power supply must be increased to sufficiently accelerate charges to match the current within the magnet which takes additional time. The traditional persistence switch technique is ideal for extended measurements, for example, moment versus temperature or time that require a limited number of fixed magnetic fields. However, measurements requiring a large number of magnetic fields, for example, a moment versus field hysteresis loop, could take prohibitively long as the additional overhead in heating and cooling the persistent switch and charging the power supply can easily add 30 seconds or more per measurement point. A potential solution to this particular problem would be to simply leave the magnet power supply constantly energized and the switch open all the time for a quick field response during the measurements that require ramping. The drawback, as mentioned earlier, is a resulting field noise from the power supply. Thus, the user is forced to prioritize either data quality or throughput when using systems that employ a traditional persistent switch. The superconducting quick switch can resolve both the magnetic field noise and slow response issues. It does so by utilizing a very thin superconducting wire segment with a much larger normal state resistance as compared to the traditional persistent switch. With the switch open, and therefore the switch heater on, 
the magnet can be charged to a given field value, as is accomplished in the traditional persistence switch described prior. Just as before, little to no electric current will pass through the relatively resistive path of the switch, as the superconducting magnet will act as an efficient DC current shunt. However, when the switch is closed and the switch heater is off, the low inductance path defined by the switch will efficiently shunt high frequency AC noise from the power supply away from the superconducting solenoid and ultimately the detection circuit and squid. Note the power supply remains energized and therefore the superconducting switch does not have to carry the same high electric current as it does for the traditional persistent switch. Therefore, the switch can be made much thinner. By virtue of being thin, the thermal mass of the superconducting switch is much smaller and the switch is thus more susceptible to rapid heat transfer and therefore can open and close much more quickly, typically in less than half a second. The quick switch technology provides a best of both worlds scenario in which the field generated by the superconducting magnet can be quickly changed while simultaneously shunting away parasitic noise. Continuing on now with temperature control. Here I show a drawing of the MPMS-3 probe, which sits inside a vacuum-jacketed liquid helium doer. Cooling of the sample chamber is accomplished by bringing liquid helium in through inlets at the bottom of the probe. For temperature control spanning 400 to 10 Kelvin, the helium is brought through a counterflow heat exchanger, shown here whereas continuous low temperature operation below 10 Kelvin is achieved using a separate impedance, not pictured. Temperature control is mediated by the gas handling module, which sits at the top of the probe. The 7 Tesla superconducting solenoid and gradiometer is located here. Unlike prior MPMS systems, the superconducting solenoid is now cooled by helium vapor and is therefore designed to sit above the liquid helium level. Having the magnet and gradiometer reside outside of the turbulent boiling liquid helium results in further reductions in measurement noise. High temperature superconducting magnet leads minimize helium boil off and the helium level is periodically checked using a helium level sensor. The squid sensor itself is located in a magnetically shielded capsule at the very bottom of the probe and is always at liquid helium temperatures. Within the probe is the sample chamber which is now only 80 centimeters long, or roughly half the length of prior generations. The shorter length, along with the advanced CFE and CLT temperature control modes, results in much faster temperature control in the MPMS-3. Whereas the MPMS-XL will take more than 90 minutes to reach base temperature, the MPMS-3 can reach 1.8 Kelvin in about 20 minutes. Note, while the temperature ramp rates are much faster in the MPMS-3, which can be useful to quickly cool or heat the sample to a given set point, we do not recommend measuring while ramping the temperature so quickly. Finally, a few quick notes about squid detection and sensitivity in the MPMS-3. This graph sums up the improved gains in sensitivity of the MPMS-3, shown as red data points, as compared to the MPMS-XL. Furthermore, considering the MPMS-3 by itself, we see that the squid VSM detection mode, the red empty circles, used on the MPMS-3 is far superior to the standard DC scan mode, exhibiting at least a five times improvement in sensitivity as well as significant gains in the data acquisition rate. Furthermore, the squid VSM mode is able to readily measure magnetic moments larger than 100 EMU, whereas the DC scan mode is limited to about 2 EMU. Changing gears now to discuss the two modes dedicated to measuring the DC magnetic moment, namely the traditional DC scan and the squid VSM modes. A superconducting second order gradiometer is inductively coupled to the squid. As the sample is scanned through the gradiometer, screening currents are generated. The squid and associated electronics then act as a very sensitive current to voltage converter and a spatially dependent voltage waveform is generated. Here are some example waveforms generated using the old MPMS XL system. By simply fitting this voltage waveform, the magnetic moment can be calculated. Remember, this fit function assumes the sample can be modeled as a small point-like dipole, which is sometimes not a valid assumption. 
For the MPMS-3, the DC scan mode is fundamentally very similar to prior generations, with some further improvements. For example, each DC scan is now a combination of two scans, one in which the sample moves upwards and another where it moves downwards. Therefore, linear squid drift can be more accurately quantified and removed. The resulting process voltage waveform is then fit using both a fixed sample center location and a center location that is allowed to move, a so-called free center fit. This can be useful in tracking the sample location as a function of temperature. All of this raw data is saved if selected by the user. We recommend to always save the raw data. Finally, and as mentioned earlier, the DC scans now contain significantly more data points than they did in prior generations. How does one assess the quality of a DC scan measurement? Firstly, inspect the DC fixed and DC free fit parameters, which are recorded in the measurement.dat file. This number varies between 0 and 1, where 1 indicates a perfect fit. Generally speaking, a fit parameter greater than 0 0.85 indicates a very good fit, and anything less than this should be treated as suspect and you should view the raw voltage waveform. If the measured waveform is not well fit by the response function, then the reported moment is not valid and should not be trusted. Remember, our software will always try to fit the waveform to the best of its ability, but it is up to you to decide if the resulting measurement is trustworthy. Poor fits could be due to several factors, including a sample which is too large in its spatial extent. Remember, our model assumes a nearly point-like dipole. A magnetic moment which is simply too small relative to the background signal. Magnetic impurity is on the sample holder. The MPMS-3 is an incredibly sensitive magnetometer, and trace amounts of impurities can result in measurable moments. For example, it only takes 4 nanograms of iron to provide a 1 micro EMU signal. If using free fit, confirm the calculated center position tracks in a gradual and repeatable way. If there are unrealistic step discontinuities or noise, then the reported data should be inspected more closely. And finally, while you are free to measure while sweeping the temperature or field, the best data is obtained when stabilizing at each control point. Here is an example of some suspect DC scan results. For the data shown here, there was actually no sample, simply an empty rotator sample holder. Upon measuring the empty sample holder, the calculated DC moment both extracted from fixed and free center fits, at first glance, appeared to show a superconducting transition near 7 Kelvin. However, after inspecting the DC fixed and DC free fit parameters, we clearly see that all of them are less than 0.5, far below our suggested 0.85. Furthermore, when inspecting the raw voltage waveform shown in red, they do not exhibit the expected shape, and the corresponding fits shown in blue and green obviously are not of good quality and are also quite different from one another. The moral of the story is, while the system will always report a value of the magnetic moment based on the measured voltage waveform, if the DC fits are not of high quality, the calculated moment value should not be trusted. In this case for the rotator sample holder, this makes sense, as there was actually no sample present, and this particular holder has a relatively large background signal, but there is no evidence of a superconducting transition. Now moving on to the SQUID VSM detection mode, which as I mentioned before, really constitutes the largest paradigm shift in the MPMS product family line. Just as with the DC scan mode, the sample resides within the second order gradiometer, which is inductively coupled to the SQUID. However, instead of scanning the sample through the entire length of the gradiometer, the sample simply vibrates at the center location. Therefore, a very small portion of the voltage waveform is actually utilized, which can be approximated as a parabola with this functional form. We also know that the sample is vibrating sinusoidally with a given amplitude A and frequency omega. Putting this all together, we have parameterized our voltage waveform to the time domain. Relatively standard lock-in techniques are then used to measure the amplitude and phase of this now time-dependent AC voltage. Firstly, we see that this voltage response occurs at 2 omega, twice the physical oscillation frequency. 
we would expect any mechanical noise due to a vibrating sample to occur primarily at the fundamental frequency omega, and therefore measuring the voltage at twice the oscillation frequency should reduce the measurement noise. We also find that the induced voltage depends on the amplitude squared. This results in a very large dynamic range for squid VSM measurements, where moments spanning 10 orders of magnitude can be readily measured using the same electronics. Finally, the magnitude of the AC voltage is independent of the vibration frequency. How does one quantify the quality of a squid VSM measurement if there is no waveform fitting or fit parameters? There are a couple of items in the measurement data file that can be quite useful. Here I show some example data measured using the squid VSM detection mode as a function of magnetic field on the left and temperature on the right. I have plotted on the top panel the magnetic moment, which is calculated using the in-phase response of the induced AC voltage. One obviously wants to ensure that this signal is not prohibitively noisy. On the middle panel, I have plotted the M-quad signal, which reports the out-of-phase response. One wants to make sure that this signal is well-behaved, that is, it doesn't exhibit large erratic jumps, and that the magnitude of this response is at least one to two orders of magnitude smaller than the extracted value for the magnetic moment as it is here. Finally, I have plotted something called the measure count. The measure count corresponds to the number of cycles or periods that were averaged together to arrive at a given value of the magnetic moment. For this particular measurement, the vibration frequency was 11.5 Hz and the averaging time was 2 seconds, which then corresponds to 23 cycles, as shown. If, for example, the squid resets during the measurement, then a given measurement cycle will be discarded. It is quite typical that for measurements performed while sweeping temperature that a few dropouts in the measure count will be observed, and this is okay as long as it remains a small fraction of the expected total. Now to discuss a couple of situations in which the squid VSM detection mode outperforms the DC scan mode. Over time, the squid voltage will naturally drift, and over short enough time scales, this drift is essentially linear. When measuring a voltage waveform during a DC scan, our fitting algorithm can account for a linear drift in the squid voltage. However, if the squid drift is nonlinear during the course of this measurement, then the DC waveforms will become very difficult to fit. As discussed in this old MPMS service note, when charging the superconducting magnet in unidirectional steps, the nonlinear squid drift can result in increased measurement noise, particularly over certain field ranges. Here I show a comparison between the DC scan, shown in blue, and the squid VSM mode, shown in red, of a thin film ferromagnetic sample with a saturation moment of about 5 micro EMU. Clearly the DC scan suffers from significant amount of noise as compared to the squid VSM mode. The lock-in amplifier based technique employed by the squid VSM mode is insensitive to nonlinear squid drift as a lock-in is only able to measure the AC component of the squid voltage at a specific frequency. While great effort has been made to ensure the magnetic field is as uniform as possible, there will undoubtedly be some degree of inhomogeneity, particularly when dealing with small applied fields. Some samples, specifically superconductors, are often measured in very small magnetic fields and can be very sensitive to small variations in the applied field. We have a lengthy application note devoted to this very topic and here I show some example data highlighting the superconducting transition of an indium sample measured in a small negative remnant magnetic field. While the squid VSM data shown in red clearly indicates a very sharp superconducting transition, the moment extracted from a DC scan, shown in blue, is significantly broadened and exhibits a clear step. Furthermore, we see that the DC free fit parameter during the transition is quite small, indicating less than ideal fits. During a DC scan, the sample moves over several centimeters, and very small variations in the magnetic field and temperature can distort the DC voltage waveform. Conversely, the squid VSM mode relies on much smaller vibration amplitudes, typically less than half a centimeter, where the magnetic field and temperature profile is significantly more uniform. Just to reiterate, the squid VSM detection mode has many benefits as compared to the DC scan mode including a larger dynamic range, faster data acquisition, it's more sensitive than the DC scan mode, it's insensitive to nonlinear squid drift, 
Measurements are performed in a more uniform magnetic field and temperature environment. And as will be discussed later, background subtraction is much easier. That being said, the DC scan mode is not without its benefits. In particular, the slow scanning of the sample holder is much gentler on the sample than the squid VSM mode. This can be important if the sample mounting contains loose components or is large or particularly massive. For example, we require the use of the DC scan mode when using the rotator, pressure cell, and fiber optic sample holders. When mounting your sample in a straw, you may also find using the DC scan mode to be beneficial. That being said, if you can securely mount your sample on the quartz paddle or brass sample holders, I strongly recommend you use the Squid VSM detection mode. The last segment of today's webinar will focus on how to improve measurement accuracy. For example, I will answer the following questions. How accurate is the reported moment value if the sample size and or shape differs significantly from that of the included palladium reference? How accurate is the magnetic field, particularly when measuring at small fields? How does one subtract the background signal from the sample holder? Here we show the measured DC moment of the palladium reference measured in a 1 Tesla field and compare squid VSM measurements, shown in red, and DC scan measurements, shown in blue. We see that the two measurement techniques yield, to within our accuracy specifications, the same magnetic moment. Furthermore, we see that the magnetic moment does not depend on the squid VSM amplitude or DC scan length. Ideally, the magnetic moment of a sample should not depend on the measurement mode, the squid VSM amplitude, or the DC scan length. In fact, during calibration of the MPMS-3 at the factory, we actually engineer this to be true for the palladium reference sample. However, what is the true moment if the sample size and or shape differs from that of the palladium sample? This very topic was discussed at length in this Review of Scientific Instruments paper from 2006. This paper describes several techniques that can be employed to calculate correction factors that one can then scale their data by in situations in which the sample size and or shape differs significantly from that of the palladium reference. And while written with the MPMS XL in mind, the results can be adapted to the MPMS 3. We also have an application note devoted to this topic and also include a calculator which will provide the necessary scale factor which can be applied to the reported moment. Note, one must divide the reported moment value by this correction factor. Here is an example of the sample geometry calculator at work. Our test sample is the now obsolete AC standard used for the MPMS-3, namely a 3mm by 3mm by 2mm rectangular prism of erbium YAG. The sample was chosen as it certainly differs in size and shape as compared to the palladium reference. Starting with the squid VSM measurements, we see that the as-measured results show a strong dependence on the squid VSM peak-to-peak -peak amplitude. This perceived dependence is unrealistic as the measured moment should not depend on the vibration amplitude. However, after applying the factor generated by the sample geometry calculator, the corrected moment no longer shows a dependence on vibration amplitude, as expected. The DC scan measurements show no significant dependence on the scan length, but instead a significant systematic offset when compared to the corrected squid VSM data. After applying the scale factor, the corrected moment values are now in line with the corrected squid VSM measurements. Moving on with correcting for field errors and magnet remnants. It is important to understand and remember that the magnetic field reported in multi-view is based solely on the amount of electric current going to the superconducting solenoid and is not based on an independent measure of the magnetic field, for example, an in situ Hall sensor. Therefore, the remnant magnetic field of the superconducting solenoid can result in an error of the reported field, particularly at small applied fields. The field error is dependent on the field charging history of the superconducting solenoid. For example, the field error can approach 20 to 30 Ørsted when ramping the magnetic field back to zero Ørsted from full field. This remnant field can result in an interesting artifact when measuring magnetically soft materials, as shown here, and is commonly referred to as an inverted hysteresis loop. We see for the inverted loop that the descending and ascending branches switch at positive and negative fields respectively which is not what we would expect for this 10 nanometer thick iron film test sample. 
It is possible to correct for the field error by first measuring the included palladium reference sample. The first step is to measure the palladium reference at 298 Kelvin using the exact same sequence used to measure the sample of interest. It is also best to stabilize at each magnetic field to make the subsequent analysis easier. Even if the sample measurement will occur at a temperature other than 298 Kelvin, it is important to measure the palladium reference at this temperature as we know the magnetic susceptibility of palladium very well at 298 K. This is an example of a measurement of the palladium reference exhibiting a well-behaved paramagnetic response. However, if one zooms in and focuses on small fields, clearly the palladium shows an open inverted hysteresis loop due to the remnant magnetic field present. The second step is then to calculate the true field. This can be done by simply dividing the measured moment by the product of the susceptibility and the mass of the palladium reference, which is written on the protective tube of the palladium reference sample. The calculated true field can simply replace the reported field values, as shown here. Clearly the corrected data set more accurately reflects the true hysteretic behavior of an iron-thin film. Here we show a comparison of the corrected data where we have used the palladium reference sample as a field sensor, shown in black, and measurements performed using the ultra-low field option, shown in blue. We see that the two measurement techniques agree well with one another. Note that the ULF option has a much higher field resolution. The ULF option utilizes a separate modulation coil and does not energize the superconducting solenoid, so remnant fields are no longer an issue. This is particularly useful for extremely soft magnetic materials, such as this YIG film, which have corrosivities of less than one ersted. Moving on to background subtraction. Depending on how the sample is mounted, the contribution from the sample holder itself may be a significant fraction of the total moment. This is particularly true with pressure cells, the fiber optic sample holder, and the rotator. In such situations, it may become necessary to subtract the background signal of the sample holder. Depending on the measurement mode, background subtraction is carried out very differently. For example, for the squid VSM detection mode, background subtraction is quite simple, and all that is required is a simple point-by-point -point subtraction of the measured moment of the background from the background plus sample measurements. This is however not recommended for measurements performed using the DC scan in which one should first subtract the measured voltage waveforms from one another before fitting the resulting waveform and applying the necessary calibrations. To demonstrate background subtraction using both the squid VSM and DC scan modes, I have chosen a 10 nanometer thick and 2 by 2 millimeter permalloy film, which has been deposited on a silicon substrate. Normally, for in-plane applied field measurements, I would simply mount this sample to a quartz paddle sample holder. However, for out-of-plane applied fields, sample mounting gets a little trickier. Here I have chosen to use the brass half-tube sample holder and quartz braces. I have added two extra quartz braces on each side of the sample to improve uniformity. This mounting technique also allows for the sample to be easily removed without altering the background only measurement. Finally, make sure to maintain the rotational position of the sample holder between measurements. To do this, I put markings on the magnetic lock and transport motor, as shown. One of the keys to successful background subtraction is to ensure as ideal of a measurement of the background as possible without altering the sample holder or measurement geometry between measurements with and without the sample. Here I show measurements using the squid VSM detection mode of the sample plus background shown in black and the background only measurement shown in red. Clearly the two measurements are of a similar magnitude, indicating the background contribution is quite large. Performing a simple point by point subtraction of the two data sets, we arrive at the sample only measurement shown in blue. We see that the sample only measurement has a saturation field of about one Tesla consistent with what we would expect from an out-of-plane measurement of a thin film of permalloy. The high field negative slope is due to the diamagnetic response of the silicon substrate. As mentioned before, background subtraction is more involved when dealing with DC scans. The first step would to be measure and calculate your system-specific calibration factor using the palladium reference sample. 
Here is an example process waveform measured at 50 ersted with the squid at its most sensitive range setting. The second step is to then fit the waveform with this equation. You should obtain a very high quality fit and take note of the amplitude A shown in red. Finally, to determine the calibration factor, simply divide the fitted amplitude by the reported moment. In this table, I have summarized the results from my system using all four measurement ranges available to the MPMS-3. The numbers for your system will be slightly different, but should be of the same order of magnitude. Note how the calibration factors differ by an order of magnitude for each measurement range, as expected. The third step is to then measure the sample plus background and background only measurements making sure to save the raw waveforms. Here I show an example of the same test sample used prior and measured at 7 tesla. We see that not only are the measured waveforms virtually identical, indicating a large background signal, but neither of them exhibits the characteristic shape that we would expect. Step 4 involves subtracting the background plus sample and background only waveforms from one another to finally arrive at the sample only waveform shown in black. This waveform can then be fit using the same equation used earlier when calculating the calibration factors, and this is shown in red. The measured amplitude A can then be simply multiplied by the corresponding calibration factor to arrive at the magnetic moment. Remember to take note of the measurement range to know which calibration factor to use. We can now add this single data point measured at 7 tesla to our background subtraction performed earlier using the squid VSM mode, and we find very good agreement between the two techniques. Ideally, this process would then need to be repeated for each magnetic field. Background subtraction must be performed by post-processing and is not automated in multi-view. However, this recent Review of Scientific Instruments paper describes a user-friendly, open-source program based in MATLAB that is useful in automating background subtraction. The application notes referenced in this webinar can be found on the application section of the QDUSA.com website. This concludes today's webinar. If you have any further questions and are currently a Quantum Design customer, then I encourage you to sign up for Pharos, our online digital database. If you have questions related to pricing, lead times, etc., then please forward your request to our sales department. If you have questions related to hardware, repairs, or installations, this request is best sent to our service department. And finally, any questions related to measurements, sample preparation, research, and of course this webinar, should be sent to apps at qdusa.com. Thank you very much for your attention.